Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, this is Wednesday night. We're studying through 2 Corinthians on Sunday. I invite you to join us. We're in chapter 5 of the second epistle to the Corinthians. Sometimes on Wednesday I'll talk about uh, the study that we're doing on Sunday or I'll con continue that. Uh, sometimes I won't. Uh, this is going to be one of those times in which I don't. Uh, and so... I had to have something to talk to you folks about. And when I try to reason within myself and think of what could be the best possible thing to talk to anyone about, given the time and times in which we're living and everything that we see going, taking place around us uh, on a global scale, uh, things that I, I think that most watchmen out there would consider uh, relevant uh, events that are taking place around us that are relevant to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, I just think that there's, there's every bit of joy and peace and, and uh, fulfillment in being involved in those activities that, that pertain to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. After all, that is he, is, he is our blessed hope. I do think, however, that very little thought is given in the, in the time in which we're, we're living. While we await his return, very much uh, eagerly, I mean, with great anticipation, awaiting his return for his body, the church, I don't think that we spend a whole lot of time thinking about what's after that, what comes after that. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, your, your mind automatically thinks, well, what, what comes after that is heaven, and what comes after that are things that we really can't comprehend, and what, what things come after that is a new body, and to be with the Lord forever and ever, and uh, to you know, perhaps hopefully see our loved ones, and and, and it, it's we live for eternity with Jesus, and uh, but I don't think that that there's been a whole lot of emphasis on that that this one subject that is probably not as comfortable to most Christians who are eagerly awaiting His return as it is others who don't even believe in the a rapture of the church. And what I'm talking about is I'm talking about how we're going to stand before him when he returns. To first of all to think that it would it's not going to make any difference how we live when we when he uh, returns and we stand before him in judgment. If I've concentrated on anything in hundreds of videos and talking to you people over the over a course of almost six years, there, there's a, I've tried to get the point across that there is a consistent theme in Scripture. In the contained within the message that was given to us, the church, the body of Christ. When we when we come out of the gospels into the, the Paul's epistles. When we cross over between the Gospels and Acts into Paul's epistles, and we come to understand the, the primary message of the New Testament, and particularly of Paul's epistles, is a love letter to God's people. There is no invitation. It is simply a, a message. The, I'm talking about the entire New Testament. It is basically a message to God's people primarily. Now you, you may find some passages in Hebrews that are that refer, make reference to those who are outside of Christ, but primarily it is a message to God's people, His children. And it's a message of not redemption. It's it's almost as if redemption is seen as God expects us to see it as as a an absolute fulfilled event that took place you know in fact we are redeemed he presents us as redeemed he speaks to us as redeemed people 
is what he does. He calls us children. He calls us sons of God. He calls us beloved. Uh, and there are other pronouns, I'm sure. But my point is, is that the message is not to people to do something in order to be redeemed. The primary message is to redeem people okay, to live and walk worthy of the calling wherewith they were called. You can almost, and I should probably write this on my website because this is, this is probably my, the best summary that I could give you of, of what I believe defines blessed hope forever. If, you're, if you've been forgiven, act like you've been forgiven. If, you, if He's given you eternal life, walk like you have eternal life. Think like you have eternal life. Respond to others as if you have eternal life. If what, no matter what God has said in this book concerning you, if it has your name on it, and by that I mean it's to those who have been set apart, sanctified in, a, in the Lord Jesus Christ, called, chosen. There's a lot of words there that may offend you, particularly when it comes to election. But folks, dearly beloved, God did not choose Abraham. He did not choose Moses. He did not choose, I can go down the list. It would take up the rest of the time in this video. He did not choose a nation, Israel, and not choose you. You are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Your new birth was an act by God, a very special process took place in your life. By that I mean it wasn't some, you're sitting around, I don't care what, what you've been told, you, it's not sitting around a table or sitting in an auditorium or sitting on your commode okay, and making some decision for there to be new life, heavenly life, the divine life, the Christ life, the eternal life infused into you based upon your own volition and your own time. Didn't happen. Sorry to burst your bubble. It didn't happen. That's not how this book presents it. And when we stand before Christ at, at His coming, it's going to make a difference how we lived our life, what we built upon in our lives, our, our message, our life, our ministry. We are said to be ambassadors for Christ, witnesses for Christ, witnesses of Christ. We preach Christ crucified and nothing but. And by that, I mean, we, cru we, we, we preach what He did, not what we must do to be redeemed. I desire to know nothing among you, among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, said Paul. I should not have to display up here on the screen, right, right down here in front of this, this door here, you know, make a list for you all to see verses that are in my Bible as well as yours that you ought to be familiar with. And then spend a whole lot of time arguing and debating over, over whether, well, that's what Paul said, that's what Paul believed. Or that's what the translation, that's how the translators translated that. Or, or there's a, an enormous problem among Christians today. One of the great biggest problems is Satan has caused the church to, it is, he's cast doubt on the authority of God's Word, the accuracy of God's Word, the, the, that His Word is inerrant. And that's not just the inspiration that it, that it took through the Holy Spirit to take and, and for the writers of Scripture to pen the words that the Holy, Holy Spirit wanted wrote. It was it, that, that work of God continued all the way down through the translators. All the way. And I don't think it stopped today. You know, we, we, we criticize their being, oh, you know, I've, I've heard Christians be very critical over the fact that there are, there's far too many translations. 
And then you've got other Christians who say, well, it's, there's not enough. I don't think that there can be too much. This book is not is propositional revelation. There's, it's nothing, folks, let me, and I say this reverently, but there's nothing on this, in this book, there's nothing in between these binders except paper and ink. Oh, well, there's probably a few other chemicals, but, you know, that's not God's Word. God's Word, we call it God's Word, and, and, and very reverently, I, 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 please don't, don't write me and say, Steve, are oh, you saying this is not, it is God's Word. What I'm saying is, is that it's just words on paper. His Word, God's Word, we are told, is much more than that. It's living, is what it is. This is the living Word. And it takes involvement by God to take and, and make that propositional revelation that we gain from it to illumine that revelation, to enlighten us, whereby then faith can be granted in our lives to trust God concerning what He has said in this book. Not believe what's, what's said. Believe the God who said it. There's, there's a difference. There's a difference there. And this process continues. We're baptized into the Holy Spirit. That is where we are identified with Christ. It is a spiritual baptism, not an outward baptism. It took place in the life of every single believer who has ever been born again. And let me, let me, let me say, and I'm not really trying to jump ahead of myself here, but no one, no one ever, ever, I'm talking about Old Testament, New Testament, I'm talking about Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, tribulation saints, if you want to talk about them, if you want to talk about millennial age, kingdom age saints, if you want to talk about them, no one from Adam forward to the end of all things, or the, or the beginning of new things, however you, you say that, was ever born again by anything they did. No one. No one. There won't be one person in heaven who gives thanks for him having received Christ, Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Sorry, just won't happen. It's not going to happen. Redemption is the primary subject of this book, and yet the word redemption is a word rarely heard from the pulpit today. Folks, the wick on the, the candle, the lantern, is burning dim. We are rapidly approaching a time in which, well, if, 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 if only you folks knew and were awake to, you know, we talk about being awake, you know, watching for the Lord to return. How about being awake to what's going on really in the, in, on earth as, as it concerns the, what we typically refer to as traditional, mainstream, conservative, evangelical Christianity. I would want to know just where I stood in, in relationship to this, what they, they taught me as, as compared to what I read in this book. No one ever decided to become a child of God, and yet that is primary the foundation upon which modern evangelical, the modern evangelical movement, that's, what re that's where it's at. That's, it was built on it. It wasn't always the case. I, I don't know how to convince Christians, and I've tried to for, over the years, this was not always the case. This, this has happened in these latter years, the last few several hundred years before his return. The truth about the, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ has been basically hijacked, I don't know of a better term to use, by a pagan Christianity who, who believes whole, they believe what they would give their lives telling you that you have to do something to be born again. 
I would suspect 99 out of 100 Christians believe that. I, I would, I'm, and I'm being very conservative here. The will of man to make that decision, the will of man, folks, never, not, not only never has it ever overridden the will of the Creator, it never will. It never will. And the word saved, which is thrown around a lot, rarely, if ever, refers to someone being born again. The word means deliverance, sozo. We are redeemed in order to be saved. And maybe we will, and maybe we won't. If you don't think that, it, let me, I don't, there's a l numerous ways I could say this. Will there be unsaved Christians in heaven? Yes, there will be. Sorry, I mean that. That's what I'm. I'm reading from Genesis to Revelation. Not some just just some passage in Paul's epistles, someplace. We are redeemed in order to be saved. In our present study in Second Corinthians, I pointed out how the children in, of Israel in the wilderness many perished. They, they didn't trust God. They didn't believe God. They didn't enter into the promised land. That promised land's not heaven. That promised land is rest. Is what it is. In Hebrews, the writer to the Hebrews, whoever that is, some say Paul, some say, I, I don't know. No, I don't think anybody does. We, we read that... Is, keep in mind, this is a, this is a book to the, to the Hebrews. Written, it was written to Hebrews. You know, I'm not a Hebrew, okay? And when I pick up that book and I read that God is speaking to non-believing Jews uh, who are redeemed, okay, and not uh, uh, believing Jews who are redeemed, then I, I've got to stop and ask myself, what you know, why? Actually, he talks to four different groups of people. There were those who had never heard of Christ. There were those who had heard heard of Christ and turned away. There were those who had heard of Christ and accepted Christ. There were those who had accepted Christ yet we're not trusting God. And then there were those who had accepted the, Jesus as the Messiah and were. That sometimes it really helps for us to identify the audience. Who's the audience, though, here in, in the entire New Testament that was written for us, the church? Who's the, who's the Holy Spirit speaking to? And is it, is it just Paul? You know, you know, do we just look at the human author or do we, do we really settle down, nail down for a fact once and for all, this is God's Word, not man's? Paul didn't write it. He wrote it, but he didn't author it. And, and it is God, God, Almighty, the majestic Creator of heaven and earth, who tells us that obedience doesn't bring blessings, but blessings brings obedience. We've turned it around. We put the cart before the horse. And yet, that's exactly what is commonly taught today. The word, first of all, the word obey doesn't even mean do. It, it means to hear, to be under the intense hearing of, of another. It is the intensified form of the Greek word akuo, which means hear. It's hupakuo. It's really, you're really hearing. That's what the word means. Yet we've made it out to mean poiao, another Greek word that, that means do. To preach obedience first and blessings second, folks, is to reverse God's order and preach law, not grace. And so many of my Christian friends and brothers and sisters in the Lord and, and, and my basically my brethren, the brethren worldwide, 
for the most part, they're not hearing the very truths that they need to bring freedom, joy, peace, rest in their lives. What they're, what they're hearing is something contrary to that, which does nothing like, at, all, at all like that. In fact, it puts, places them further in, in chains, in bondage. They're ground and ground into believing that, they, that they've got to trust in themselves. Oh, the, pa the preachers won't stand up there and preach that. They won't put that in so many words, but basically what they're preaching is that's, that's what they're preaching. How often do you hear it said that the sin issue in this life, in the, in the Christian's life, has been forever settled? We don't even need to talk about it anymore. I mean, as far as that sin standing between, there being some sin standing in between God and the child of God, well, first of all, it's, it's so ludicrous and ridiculous, I don't know how anybody could even entertain the thought of that, but so many of my Christian friends are burdened by that. Because they have a problem with forgiveness. Well, I just, I know, you, you know, I know, Steve, you know, it says that he forgives me, but I don't know, I don't know. Why do they believe that? Why do you think they believe that? Why do you think they lack that peace and joy and rest that God wants them to have? Because of all the cleverly devised fables that they've been spoon fed. And I say that because they're, they're, there's some thought to go all around, okay? They're not studying this book like they should. Second of all, the, the Christian was crucified with Christ, buried with Him, and raised with Him to walk in newness of life. Yet we want to keep Him, we want to keep Him, I don't know, uh, alive. We don't want, he, we think He doesn't need death to self. He does. We've got to keep Him Focused on things below, not on things above. He hasn't really been raised with Christ, raised with Christ, crucified with Christ. That's, that's nice. That's po that's great poetry, Steve. Boy, God is the poet here. Yeah, but what does it mean? You know, it means a lot. Just as as redemption is indispensable to our justification. Just just as I, as Christ dying in our place is indispensable to our justification. Our death with Him is indispensable to our sanctification. Sanctify them in truth, thy word is truth. So it's been settled forever. Cast as far as the east as the west. You people know these things. We, we died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and even death itself. Yeah, we died to death. Right, look, you can't get any more dead than that. But you've been, a, you've been made alive in Christ. Now, what your Bible is asking, what God is asking you to do in chapter after chapter and verse after verse is walk like who you are. Not, like, not, not try, walk like, like someone who's trying to become something that he's not, that he thinks he's not. God doesn't chasten His children because of sin. Oh, Steve, I know in Hebrews it says He chastens every son whom He receives. You're exactly right. Chastening is not in relation to sin. It's because we're chastened because we're sons. Our Father's training us in love. We're His children. God doesn't punish His children because of sin. Never does He punish His children because of sin. That's a myth. I'm reading about the righteousness of God based on faith. That faith's righteousness. I trust God. Righteousness, it's the righteousness of God that's manifest. If I'm not trusting God, it's not. Uh, Righteousness, the righteousness of God isn't, it's not achieved on a human level. Okay. And yet we Christians by the scores go about trying to make that make that a reality. 
all our righteousness, all righteousness is of the Lord. All ours, ours is as filthy rags. Filthy rags. Now, I would bet that if you lined up ten Christians, maybe five of them might have heard that before. But all ten of them are probably living, trying to live out their filthy rags righteousness. I, I don't get it, folks. I'm sorry. I've been doing this a long time. I, 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 it, I think that the, the, it's a, the result of, of being taught fables as well as the believer not studying. It has to be. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. That's not something that you asked for. That's not something that you earned. And boy, this one, this one, people really, I don't, for some reason, they don't seem to be too thrilled about this one. It's the one, this, is, this one's thrilled me my whole life. I, I know it sounds maybe perhaps a little arrogant, but you got to understand the dynamics and the forces working behind it. And that is the, Christ, the every child of God is as righteous as Jesus Christ Himself. Do you live like that? No, Steve, I don't no, I don't live like that. I mean, why not? God said it. You've been made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. When the Heavenly Father looks down upon you, He sees you as righteous as His Son. Where are the pulpits teaching you that today? Where? Where are they? Uh, it, if you know of any, please email me. Send me a list. Send me, send me. I'll Google them out. I'll, I'd love, to, I'd love to visit the place. I really would. And that righteousness of God is based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. I've often said, "There's nothing. I don't. This is what I believe. You don't have to believe it. Just because Steve believes it, just but." You've heard me say it a lot, I think. I'm sure you have. I believe with every fiber of my being that God's greatest desire is that we trust Him. Beyond all things. And I believe faith exercised equals the righteousness of God made manifest I do not believe that our physical... There's another myth floating. It's been floating around for a couple of hundred years, I believe at least, or maybe longer. I don't know. That, you know, our physical body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. It's not. Our physical body is not a temple of the Holy Ghost. Christians are members of the one temple. Jesus Christ. We're members, all of us members of one, that one temple. We're not a bunch of little temples running around, okay? And that is commonly taught, in the, in the, and one of the reasons why that, that is mis, so mistranslated or so misunderstood, it, it is to, it's to keep the believer under bondage to the law. Because if I can convince you that your body is a temple, well, now I can say you can't. Well, now you, now you can't. You can't do this, and you can't do that. You can't. You can't eat. You can't eat fried okra, and you can't eat. You know, I can just go down the list. And that's basically how modern Christianity today uses it, folks. The greatest expression of God ever toward us was the death of His Son the greatest expression of love is death. That's, that was true in, in God doing that for us, but let me tell you, it is also just as true in our lives. The greatest expression of love is death. If we do not understand His sacrifice, what He did for us, we don't understand His love. And He's coming back 
and I want you to stand before him. Having known that you stood before him here and now, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Look, I love you all. I truly do. See you Sunday.